Welcome to the 51st episode of the New Ventures Podcast. I am your host, Sanjoy Sanyal, the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique climate finance firm and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judge Business School. I host the New Ventures Podcast to help people starting climate initiatives learn from others who are already progressed in their paths. We've been doing a series on early stage climate innovation in the UK. And to conclude these series of podcasts, we have on in this episode, two early stage entrepreneurs, Andy Hale and Natalia Doffman, who are making really impressive progress. Andy is the founder of Xtons, which provides organizations with the data and analytics to reduce carbon emissions. Natalia is the founder of Kita, which provides carbon insurance. And both Andy and Natalia were part of the Cambridge's Carbon Titan program whose founder, Chris Coleridge, was our guest in July last year. Welcome, Andy. Welcome, Natalia. Hey, Sandro. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Andy, we will start with you. Both of you are building a business that's really tackling difficult problems. In your case, Andy, organizations are just stupefied as to how to measure emissions. Could you help us understand what you're doing? Sure. I wouldn't use the word stupefied. I would say that quite often businesses lack confidence. They're a little bit apprehensive about decarbonization for many different reasons. So what Exxon's are doing is we've built a carbon action software to help organizations and people decarbonize with confidence. And that starts with their emissions and their data, which can come in all different forms. It progresses to setting targets that suit their business and then developing an action plan that they can actually deliver against to making sure that decarbonization happens in every single organization that we engage with. Tell you in your case, you're enabling companies to do carbon removal and not just reduction, right? That itself is also quite tricky. Yes, yes, exactly. We Kita is a carbon insurance company. And so what that means is that we insure transactions in the carbon markets. And the reason we set up Kita was to be an enabler to drive more financed to help high quality carbon removal projects scale. It's not just carbon removal. I think there's other very high quality carbon projects out there that also need financing. But really, it was when we were in carbon 13 and we were speaking to other people in the cohort who were looking at building hard tech type solutions. And coming from the background of myself and my two co-founders, finance, law, insurance, we saw the lack of specialist insurance in the space as being a ceiling to growth. Because at some stage, these companies will need to access project finance, you know, grant financing venture isn't enough. And without insurance, you don't access that type of capital. And so thus, that was the genesis for Kita. And that's what we've been doing ever since is developing are doing at least our best to develop insurance products that enable financing to help high quality carbon project scale. What I found common about both your organizations, which is why it's so nice to have both of you on this call, is that you are both enabling action by cutting out complexity. So what I call demystifying it. In your case, Andy, companies, you said they are not stupefied, they they at least have some apprehension. But apprehension really comes from the fact that don't have sufficient data and emissions to start off with. So how do you kind of address this issue? Sure. I mean, it's multifold, really. It's quite often organizations do have the data somewhere. They just can't locate it and they don't know what it looks like. And other times, state organizations don't have the data. So what we've tried to do with Extons is, I guess you could say, gamify the process and simplify it by the first step. It doesn't need excessive amounts of data to get a carbon emission in the first instance. We can work with as little as 15 data points. And what we do is we essentially model a footprint of an organization and that gives us a range. And everything we do comes with an uncertainty range because that model is almost certainly wrong. But at least if an organization doesn't can't access any further data, they have an an understanding of where their emissions sit across their organization. What we then do, that creates different blocks in the software and it provides a bit of a map for the customer in terms of, okay, where do I need to look to next to refine this data? And that's why when I said gamify the process, 
It's about breadcrumbing the different stages that a customer might need to go to to access the data to refine their assessment. And why refine is important is everything we do, we want to drive towards action. So we don't want people to be finessing their footprint for years to come because then they'll never reduce it. But why refine can be important is because it gives you much more tangible levers to drive decarbonization. So something we do is we work across scope one, two and scope three, which can be broken down into 15 subcategories. We can also footprint products and being able to get into the detail of different organizations of product level emissions requires more data, but it gives more opportunity for action. Um, so instead of doing a really high level assessment, perhaps based on spend, where your main lever is spend less or spend different, you can start looking at material quantities and material types or many different aspects of where carbon resides across a business. But to simplify that journey, it's all about breadcrumbing, really, Sanjoy, and helping people get to a point where they're confident that the uncertainty is reduced enough for them to take a a decision on how to decarbonize. I think that makes sense. You know, just uh, iterating is the way I'm understanding this. I mean, I talk talk to organizations all the time, so I get the apprehension and I get what what you're trying to do. But do organizations say, oh, 15? I have nine or 10. So, for example, for the five, do you have proxy data or publicly available information which you can sort of use in some way or the other? Yeah, so... In our model, we have thousands of data points, so we can compensate for an organization who lacks that data. And it all comes down, really, Sandro, to the size of the organization. If you're a significant corporate, you need to be looking at all 15 subcategories of your scope three. If you're a smaller business, you don't. So the way our model works, it can compensate differently depending on the size of the organization. And for some of our larger clients where they don't have access to that data, we can provide I guess, a temporary assessment um, or really help them understand the size of emissions that they're looking for. And again, it it provides this map for them to go out within the organization. We've developed quite a comprehensive data guidance framework as well for each area of their business. Again, to give them the necessary information they need to improve their data collection and provide it to us. But to your point, not every business needs to account for all 15 subcategories, but the larger ones do. And Natalia, in your case, I think the complexity starts from the fact that carbon removal technological methods are not yet established, right? So the way I am interpreting it, you're ensuring for a product or a service that quite doesn't exist. Or have I got it wrong? Yeah, I mean, it's probably about half, right? Carbon removal can take different forms. And so carbon removal can be both nature-based carbon removal, such as afforestation. And then I think often when people say carbon removal, they're talking about the technologies, such as direct air capture or enhanced weathering or biochar. So again, the availability of the data or the readiness of that carbon removal solution depends greatly on what type it is. We have obviously been planting trees for many, many years. There is a lot of data in terms of some of the nature-based solutions, particularly like what Andy said, when you look for proxies for data. Within the insurance industry, you have tons of data around natural catastrophe risk and forestry insurance in in this form of timber. So you do have some data proxies there. And then in terms of the newer technologies, that definitely is where it becomes a challenge and where we think of the insurance product that we have available now and then the others that we're developing as a kind of scalable as the new technologies take greater shape. So when a technology is very, very early in its readiness journey and within the carbon markets, it doesn't have the things that we need. We do need data, but we also need third party audits. We need ongoing monitoring and verification. We need reasonably established framework to assess a project at the start of its life to forecast the amount of carbon a removal that it will be able to achieve over the coming X number of years. When those things don't exist, those kind of underpinnings of the market, that's when the insurance really can't exist. And so right now, part of what we do on the really technological carbon removal side is work with those other providers in the market to try and help them understand the risk frameworks and data needs that the insurance industry will have in order to develop more products. And then where we see the most kind of live interest really honestly right now is still in the nature-based space. 
which while there are high risks there, you know, climate change itself will obviously impact upon nature based solutions. That is also where the majority of the carbon markets are. So it's a combination of those two things. But I think just to echo what Andy said, we also have a real focus on the drive to action. I think from the insurance perspective, you know, within the carbon markets, there are a lot of risks and there are a lot of uncertainties. And that is a real impediment to action. I think understandably, particularly for corporates with net zero strategies who are looking to engage in the market, it's a reasonably scary place to engage and that can impede action. Um, and I think is we're seeing it is impeding action. But when you look at the scale of investment that we need, both to capture carbon, but also to improve biodiversity around the world, we don't really have the time. And so I see that one of the real benefits of insurance as being a stamp of confidence on these carbon purchases and investments. Because not only have you done the due diligence that you're able to do in today's market environment with the data availability, but an insurance company has also done that due diligence. And they haven't just done the due diligence, but they've also backed it in the form of saying, if we're wrong, we'll actually compensate you by an insurance claim. So I think that's a really powerful thing. And then we also very much, like Andy said, think about it as an ongoing refinement of data. Insurance in a new market is inherently somewhat handicapped by a lack of data. And you've seen this in other new markets like cyber insurance or crypto. But that's why startups come in and help pave the way. And then if you can access that data and build an effective framework to analyze it quickly, then as the data improves, you have an advantage to build out more insurance and lower the cost points. So that's one of the strategies for us, definitely, in terms of this new market. And what progress have you made, Andy? Sure. And before I answer that, Natalia used the phrase, the data proxy, which is probably one of the most important phrases in the entire carbon sphere that not enough people use. You can't measure it's incredibly difficult to physically measure carbon. At no point, you know, you throw in a net over a building or a car or whatever you're measuring and physically measuring the amount of carbon that is emitted. You're always using proxies. You're always taking a different measurement and converting that to carbon. And that's a super important thing. And when we talk about improving data quality, you're really improving the proxy because you're reducing the uncertainty that you have in that conversion to a carbon equivalent. And that, I think, sometimes is can be quite difficult to communicate to people. Um, but once people realize it, it unlocks something in their mind a little bit, and they really understand the framework of how you account and you decarbonize much more easily. Um, traction, how are we doing? We're doing okay. So we're revenue generating. Uh, so in the last... 12 months or so, we've grown our client roster. The fantastic thing is we work with organizations. We have a FTSE 100, for instance. So we just helped Acardo, if you're familiar with them, disclose their scope three emissions uh, as part of their TCFD disclosure. And they are one of our clients that perhaps people have heard of. We're supporting the likes of Tideway, creating the big super sewer in London, um, which is really exciting client to have on board as well and we're supporting organizations across the country really mainly across the uk uh, another exciting client team london bridge they're a business improvement district in london they represent 340 businesses in that area and the fantastic thing we've been able to do there is open up the exton software to as many businesses within that location as would like to use it and support tlb create this place-based decarbonization strategy and essentially aggregate the assessment into one place-based assessment so they can pinpoint hotspots and think about how do we help businesses within our area decarbonize. So in terms of commercial, how things are going, they're going okay, they're going well. And I think your other question perhaps was in terms of raises. So we were part of the Carbon 13 Cohort 1 who invested in our pre-seed we did a, a small follow on round since then based on the organizations and customers we've been able to onboard. We've then been able to grow organically since then, which is brilliant. But as we move into the future, we will look at conducting another race. Well, obviously, that's very impressive in terms of the customer traction. And Talia, 
What is your progress? Yeah, of course. I was just going to say congratulations to Andy. That's amazing. Yeah, thanks. We've made a ton of progress, very different than Andy, than x -Tons, I think, probably in large part because we're insurance is very specific, of course, in that you need to become regulated in multiple ways before you're able to engage with clients. So since ending Carbon 13, I guess we were in cohort two. So we started in September 21. I started working with my co-founders, Paul and Tom, in October. We incorporated Kita in December 21. All of 2022 was the combination of both classic every startup does it. So, you know, we had to develop our first product. So a lot of customer kind of discovery on that front. We had to do raises. So we raised from Carbon 13 and then we topped that up with a smaller kind of extra pre-seed round. So that was 350,000. And then in December, we raised 4 million in the seed round, which was great. And we hired some of our early team. But then also the really key things that we did in 2022 were achieve the regulatory permissions to sell insurance. So we became an appointed representative in the UK, a term that I don't need to get into, but it means we're allowed to sell insurance in the UK. And then even more excitingly, we became a cover holder within Lloyd's of London. So Lloyd's of London is the world's largest insurance marketplace. And Lloyd's has, it is not an insurance company, people often think it is, but it's a marketplace within which many insurance companies function. And it has a structure called a cover holder. And so what that means is companies like Kita who develop and sell insurance, but we don't hold the regulated capital to pay insurance claims. Achieving that structure of holding your own regulated capital takes years. You have to raise, you know, hundreds of millions. And so instead, we're backed by larger insurance companies who function within Lloyd's. So we're backed by Chaucer, Munich Re, and Renaissance Re. And so they are the ones who who actually pay the claims to our clients and they provide, again, that extra level of trust for a large corporate who's engaging in a risky carbon transaction. They don't need a risky insurance company backing them. They want a, a well-established, you know, A-rated insurance company backing them. And so thus the, achieving that cover holder status under Lloyds of London and getting that backing from Chaucer, Munich and Rent was both, I think, essential to setting us up for success, but also was essential to actually allowing us to sell insurance. And so the sort of 2022 was really, I always thought of it going from like zero to one. And then we released our product carbon purchase protection cover at the end of January of 23. Since then, it's been a very exciting time in terms of seeing the interest and also a very much a learning experience because we're introducing we're one of the early movers insuring this market. And so we're introducing a brand new product and it's helping people understand how insurance can fit into the transactions and replace how they've been managing risk in the past. And so it's the education piece of how do you actually quantify how insurance can become a better method, a more cost effective method of risk management versus how they've been buying carbon previously and then working with clients to incorporate that insurance into their transactions. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And also we have, of course, hired a team. So we now have a team of around 10, 10 people, which is great. So it feels like a real business. Uh, well, congratulations to both of you, actually. What I find interesting is at a one fundamental level, you have one common approach. I mean, two different businesses just shows how complicated this sustainability business is. You know, Andy and Sally, you both use the word data proxies. The way I understand is an iterative model, right? You know, Andy, in your case, okay, if you don't have data, you have some other data. In your case, Natalia, okay, you know, let's start with nature-based solutions, then build up the foundations for other technology-based carbon removal processes. So we're not going to build Rome in a day, that's, but we need to start. We need to start action. It's, it is really common through between both your businesses but being different businesses and having gone through the incubation processes you obviously both of you have, are doing real business you have a team which is great and you know you have done different way I mean and you have sold to lots of customers Natalia in your case you have the important partners to help establish the product in the first place and of course raise the capital that's necessary to be an insurance company at least 
to start the process of being a respected insurance company. So it's two different parts, but there is a lot of fundamental commonalities that I see in, in this. And of course, we can talk a lot about your business. What I'm hoping in this podcast is that there are a lot of young entrepreneurs out there who are you know, going into incubation and they want to know what's it like going into incubation, you know, what you get. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we will get that story out in the next uh, in a few minutes, 25 minutes or so. And I want to start by something like a personal reflection. And you said you were the first cohort and, and uh, Natalia, you were the, in a later cohort. Just tell us a little bit about the time in your lives when you're personally deciding to apply for Carbon 13. What is going on? Maybe, Natalia, we can start with you. I mean, we've been starting with Andy. Yeah, so before going to Carbon 13, my career, which I'd done for about 15 years, was in business development and strategy for large global law firms. And I'd originally majored in environmental science, but then I'd sort of fallen into that career, which is a great job. It's basically working with these large law firms, doing things like client relationship management and trying to identify where trends were evolving in the market such that we could evolve our legal services to our clients. And while I'm not a lawyer, it enabled me to learn a lot about different types of industries and different types of law because you're not very good at business development or strategy if you don't understand those two things. So I did that for 15 years in New York, Brussels, and London. And in London, I spent eight and a half years at a law firm called Clyde & Co., which is the world's largest insurance-focused law firm. And so that's where I'd learned about the insurance industry. And really, it had struck me at Clyde & Co. how important insurance is to the functioning of the global economy. It's one of those things people don't think about, but if insurance doesn't exist, Quite literally, almost nothing works. Like buses don't leave, fl- planes don't fly, people don't start businesses because you're directly liable. All of these things, insurance is a huge functional enabler and is behind almost anything you read about in the news. So I learned at Clyde Co. And then over time, I became global head of new business. And in that role, I led this business development strategy for the firm's climate risk practice. So I suppose that was sort of the starting point to move to Carbon 13. I'd been promoted while I was on maternity leave, and they said when I came back, you know, what kind of new business should we be going after? And this was obviously post-Paris Agreement, et cetera. And I said, there has to be tons of work for us to do in this evolving climate change space with the regulations and the liabilities increasing. And so I started working with the lawyers there, and I learned an incredible amount about everything that was happening. But also it sort of took me back to my university days when I had studied climate change, actually, back in sort of 2000 to 2005, I studied climate change and its impact on tree growth back then. And so I suppose I came back to a point where I was relearning all this stuff, but learning it with even more data that we now have available. And I thought, either I'm going to have to sort of put this to the side and just hope someone else deals with this problem, <laughs> or I'm going to have to devote the rest of my career to focusing on this just because it's so big and it's so important. It's so just now, right? You just like, you get to that point, like we can't just keep messing around. We need to take action now. And because I'd worked at law firms for for so long, I knew how hard it was for large corporates to really act in a dramatic way, right? You have all of these governance structures, which you need to have. And so I definitely saw the role for startups in terms of, coming out and developing new solutions and having the ability to fail. But I will say I wasn't pinned on having my own startup at all. I just wanted to spend the rest of my career only doing climate change. And I couldn't do that at Cloud & Co because my job was a lot broader than that. And so I started looking at opportunities at other companies to work in sustainability teams, et cetera. It wasn't quite clear what I would do if I left law. And so honestly, I just, the sort of Carbon 13 opportunity popped up on my LinkedIn. It said, do you want to start a climate tech startup? And at Clyde & Co., I had a career coach, a kind of personal coach that they'd given me. Um, and at some point she had said to me, you sound like the kind of person who should work at a startup. And so when that popped up on my LinkedIn, I thought, well, I'll give this a go. And in all honesty, I didn't think much about it. I just applied, sent it off. And then when I got to interview stage, I took it very seriously. And I realized that actually if I was accepted, it was very much an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And I think what it gave me the safety to do was to leave a very well-established corporate career at a point in which I had two young children and a mortgage and all of these things. 
uh, and fortunately a husband who still is working. But it gave me a kind of structure and safety net to actually just take the full leap and say, I am stopping Clyde & Co. I am now a founder, you know, within Carbon 13, and I have nine months to kind of sort this out. It provided that safety, whereas I think if I had tried to start a business while also working or trying to find a co-founder, I don't know if I ever would have done it. And so that was probably the key thing was giving me a kind of time frame. This is when it starts uh, really set periods of time. And yeah, and then I think generally speaking, once I tell myself I'm going to do something, I take personal pride in always achieving it. So I sort of was reasonably comfortable that once I had decided I was going to start a climate tech startup, that I would do that. I think within Carbon 13, the biggest question I had was the first six weeks where I thought it's wholly possible I just won't find a co-founder that I want to start a business with. This is a fascinating story, and I can almost hear the determination in your voice, Natalia. But Andy, what's yours? Yeah, I mean, firstly, hugely inspiring story, Natalia. And the other inspiring thing that you've done is that four million pound raise. I mean, I know I've said well done before, but awesome. Like to do that so quickly as well after forming Kita, you set the target um, and it's a great target. My story. So yeah, I started off life, I guess, as a consultant. I um, did a PhD, fell into consultancy. Management consultancy was all right. I enjoyed aspects of it. I didn't. Then I became an academic as an assistant professor at Exeter in engineering and entrepreneurship. Ironically, at the time, having done zero entrepreneurship, but Sandroy, you know what academia is like. As long as you've got some knowledge about it or experience, they they welcome you with open arms and you figure it out. And what appealed to me about academia is I was told you're essentially self-employed with a salary. I was like, that sounds quite good. I like the, the idea of that. So I did it for a few years and there was aspects of it that I really enjoyed, but there was aspects of it that I didn't. And I always had this bug in the back of my mind where I was just like, I just want to do my own thing. That's what I'm most happy. That what empowers me is what gets me out of bed in the morning when I can set my own agenda and, and get out and do something. And at the same time, the world's slowly crumbling and not enough people are doing things about it. Let's stop just talking about it and criticizing other people and do something about it. I mean, my story then, one of my co-founders banked. Um, We did a PhD together many years ago. He did his PhD in essentially carbon, and he's an expert in carbon. This is where the carbon expertise comes into the business. And we chatted, and we were like, hey, should we start a business? Um, So we did. And this was just before COVID. So this was like February 2020. Bank left his. He was doing a little bit of part-time stuff. COVID hit, and... We had a few different ideas for what we were working on. The good thing about COVID is it really gave us a good six, seven months to think about what we wanted to do. And by about the November 2020, we'd come up with this concept of rapid carbon footprints. So Banked had spent years helping organizations, helping events like World Cups, Olympics, lots of different brands that you might be familiar with. Think about how they can assess the footprint of their products and operations and events. It's super expensive to pay consultants to do this. And really, you're following a framework. Aspects of it aren't super complicated. It can get really complicated. But the basics are, in essence, you're multiplying two numbers together. Now, to find those two numbers is very difficult. But when you when you boil it down, aspects of carbon accounting is you're multiplying two things together, which is not difficult. So we're like, well, why is it so expensive? Can we build this into a software? And the initial aim was to make carbon footprinting more accessible to smaller businesses. And this, I think in December 2020, Chris Colridge followed me on Twitter. So I looked it up and he was just starting Carbon 13. And I was like, oh, this seems interesting. And chatted to Bent. And we applied essentially because we had, we had this idea of a business and we were building it and we'd spoken to some customers. We we're in customer discovery and we were just like, well, Neither of us knew anything about building a software business. Neither of us knew anything about raising money from VCs or angels. There were so many other aspects of it we weren't aware about. And honestly, we're just like, well, maybe these guys can help. So we applied and thought, let's be part of this. It's cohort one. It could be quite interesting. It was clear they were still figuring things out, which we saw as an opportunity as well, rather than join something that was 12 cohorts in and really predefined and it was a structure. We were a pre-existing team. 
So I remember speaking to Chris saying, look, is this an issue? They very much seemed like a, a version of Entrepreneur First where you come in as a as an individual and they, they do the teaming. He assured me it wasn't an issue. Um, and I know since they've now got a completely separate track for pre-existing businesses. And yeah, it was just then a, an incredible experience. And we entered with, with two aims. One, find out more about growing a business through fundraising and all the things that come with that. And two, find a third co-founder. And we left with both, which is great. Brilliant. One of the things Carbon 13 does, which you have both touched upon, is to bring together different types of people and with the idea that they would find co-founders, right? In your case, Andy, you already had one co-founder and you found a third co-founder. And maybe, Natalia, you can tell us how you found the co-founder. To me, the reason I bring this up is finding a co-founder is not science, right? It's a bit about art. It's a lot, I believe, about creating self-awareness. Who am I? What are the type of person I work with? What is it that I need? And that's, I suspect, is not easy. Lots of self-help books are written on that topic. Yeah. I mean, one of the great things I think Carbon 13 did was bring together a bunch of people who were at the stage of their life where they wanted to do a business and they wanted to do a climate focused business. I honestly, I don't know where I would have found a co-founder from because my friends or my co-workers were all broadly speaking similar to me. And I don't think any of them would have wanted to do it at that point in their life. So there's a real timing thing, which was a great thing for Carbon 13 to bring those people together. I found the first six weeks of Carbon 13 probably the hardest overall time almost of my entire time with Kita. <laughs> really stressful. I think there were about 78 people in our cohort. And I spent the first couple of days talking to them. And then I realized I just didn't remember who anyone was. And so thus, I set up an Excel spreadsheet where I had everyone's name. And I had a little tick box of whether or not we'd had a conversation. And then a sort of yes, no, maybe notes type thing. And so some people went into the no quite quickly just because I could tell we weren't going to be able to work together either personality wise or just we had no overlap in interest or skills. And then there were a ton of people in the maybe column. And so I somewhat systematically tried to speak to those people to narrow them down. And a lot of it was relationship driven. So it's very much like, do I think we could work together rather than what will we work on? Because it doesn't almost really matter. You'll figure it out. So I had some sort of like close relationships that were front runners. And then actually, interestingly, Paul and Tom, who are my co-founders, they weren't on my list because they came into it as a team already. And in the kind of split that Carbon 13 does, where you have your commercial founder and your technical founder, I was a commercial founder, very little technical to my skills. But Paul and Tom, I assumed one of them was the commercial founder and one of them was the technical founder. And so I didn't speak to them that much. I spoke to them enough to know that I liked them and they were good guys. And I remember thinking that one of them could maybe be an advisor to my business or something because of their financial services expertise. But I didn't think about teaming up with them. And then I went on a walk with one of the women in the cohort and we were having this kind of wider conversation that you touched upon, the sort of knowing yourself. I think I tend to be a person who is very, very confident in my own abilities. And Carbon 13 was probably one of the few times where I really questioned what exactly am I bringing to this because I run the climate change practice, but I'm not a climate change expert. It's sort of like, what am I good at? And so I was, we were having that kind of conversation. And as she referenced you would be perfect for a team with Paul and Tom. And so she said they're looking for a, a business development strategy type person. And so then I remember I went straight back and I sent them a long message saying I would be perfect. <laughs> you should work with me. And I pitched them the idea I had, which was the insurance company idea. And then it all happened quite quickly. Once I realized that they were open to a third team member, I pursued them quite directly. And then when we decided to team up, I think one of the benefits of Paul and Tom is, again, they're similar to me in their age and their experience, and they both have kids. And so I knew that we would be able to sort of understand each other's lives and schedules. Again, it always felt like once we decided to be a team, I think I had maybe like a week's concern that because they'd known each other for years, they could just drop me. It was probably a week that I sort of thought, Ooh, what if this happens? And then I realized it would never happen because it was quite like we agreed. 
And then we committed and we've never wavered on that commitment in like a nice marriage. We might disagree on things, but we never disagree on the fact that we're a great team and we should build this business together. So, yeah, I mean, they've been exceptional. It's been an amazing um, experience working with them. Brilliant. And Andy, yours was exactly the flip side of the Italian story, right? You two are a team and you founded Third Founder. I mean, yeah. obviously dying to know. Yeah, almost exactly right, Sandro. And um, I just want to pick up on something Natalia said then in terms of being incredibly confident, but going through this process and being essentially the way I interpret it is being stripped down and just like broken. And for anybody listening who wants to be an entrepreneur, that will happen to you. And the whole first six, I can't remember, six, eight weeks was this teaming process. At the time for us, it was COVID. So everything was remote. We weren't in person. So it was, I think there was 50 people or 60 people on the cohort. And it was these intense 10, 15 minute one-to-one chats on Zoom. And it was great, but I was felt, well, first of all, to get in, Carbon 13 compiles this array of talent like you've never seen before. People like Natalia, you know, with these incredible backgrounds. I'm always on this call feeling like I'm the kid who snuck in the back door and very happy to be there, but wanting to meet a co-founder, but just in awe of all these stories that are coming in of these different people. Um, but I always felt as well a little bit, I guess guilty. And Beck and I chatted about this quite a bit because I had banked. We were in a team. Yes, we wanted a third co-founder, but in essence, we were already through to phase two because we had a team. We teamed. We were pre-teamed. Um, so that pressure was not quite as acute. And I remember, I think it was maybe week three or week four, and the whole atmosphere seemed to change in the cohort from this relaxed, getting to know each other sort of vibe to, oh, this team has formed and a celebration went up on teams. And you can see people being like, the numbers of people are dwindling to team with and partner with. And there was a real sense of anxiety, I think, in the remaining people who hadn't teamed. And some people, I think, dealt with that uh, differently to others. But yeah, we always felt a little bit guilty. But we were looking for a third co-founder who is Vanessa, who joined us eventually. Interestingly, We'd met Vanessa, she was on our list, but she formed a different team, so then went off the list. So we were talking to other people. And we essentially got to phase two, and we said we were just carrying on as a two because we hadn't found the right person. Some of the people we'd spoken to, they joined other teams. They wanted to start something from scratch. They didn't want to join something even five minutes down the road and wanted to be involved in the whole journey, which we completely got. And so we were like, we don't have to find a third. Let's go as a two. We're very happy with a two. The other thing to remember is, Carbon 13, as great as the 60 people were on there, it's just one area. There's many other people in the world that we could find a third, fourth, fifth co-founder from. So we wanted to keep going through. And actually what happened is we went all the way to phase three to source the funding. It just banked and I. We sourced the investment from Carbon 13, which was great. And Vanessa had formed another team um, with another co-founder, and they secured funding as well. And then we were at an event and essentially they decided not to take the money and disband. So when I was like to bank, Vanessa's available. We need to move quickly because perhaps a little bit like Natalia, like you just, once you know that somebody's going to strengthen your team, you just focus being like, we, we want you on board. We want you to come and join us. And we had a few conversations and she agreed to come on board. And then all of a sudden we'd gone from a team of two with no investment to a team of two with investment, to a team of three with investment. And it was sort of then just onwards and upwards from there. And that's all down to Carbon 13. Yeah, but Andy, when you came in, you wanted a third partner, right? And mm-hmm. why was that? And what was your thinking in your mind? Yeah, so we wanted a third co-founder. And what was important to us was the type of person rather than their skill set, I think. We weren't sure whether that was a technical person or a commercial person. It ended up being a commercial person. And the reason for that is because Vanessa was the best fit for us as an organization. People talk about the pub test. We did this Gallup strength thing as part of Carbon 13, which was really helpful. It helps you understand where your strengths are and, and what you're good at. And in terms of team formation, perhaps you can use it to develop the best composition of a team. What we were looking for more than anything was someone to share the journey with us, someone who was passionate about doing something positive for the world, somebody that we could work 60, 70, 80, 90 hour work weeks with uh, and not kill each other, which is really hard to know whether that's going to happen. And of course, there's always disagreements throughout the journey. Ultimately, just somebody we liked 
and enjoyed engaging with. And then we're like, well, look, if it doesn't work out, at least we're going to have fun doing it. And we're all coming with the same set of values and the same objectives. Uh, so that's what we prioritized in looking for a third co-founder. And that's ultimately what we found in Vanessa. I mean, one thing that I find common, and I don't know that I'm reading too much into this, is Natalia's comment about interest in working with somebody, not necessarily being too concerned of working on something. And it's the same mentality that you have, you know, the ability to, to get along and the ability to have difference of opinion, but be able to manage it. Yeah. A common 13 are very, that was their big thing, right? You can have a great idea, but with the wrong team, it's not going to go anywhere. You can have a mediocre idea or a poor idea with the right team, it can go somewhere. And it is all about the team and the idea can change at multiple stages. But if you get the right team around you, it will make the difference. Yeah, I agree on that. I think I didn't realize that when I first started speaking with Carbon 13, I assumed you had to have this amazing idea, which I think a lot of people do. And actually, the idea is almost slightly irrelevant at the early stages because you can have like 15 ideas. If anyone who knows anything about climate change sits down with someone else who does and they only think about that for a week, they'll quickly have like 50 ideas. And so then it really is around can you work together, but then can you execute upon the chosen idea such as that that idea will will change and evolve over time. You know, we were very clear on we will build an insurance company. I say that is the thing that we never changed, but the exact nature of what we thought we should ensure did change. And it's just impossible for the idea not to evolve. So it, it is very much can you execute in the process? Right. So we talked a little bit about the first teaming phase and, and he's already started talking about the time where you go away from Cambridge and you actually build the idea. Just give us an insight into that period. I mean, from my perspective, I suppose, in all honesty, after the teaming bit, I felt pretty comfortable. I think, again, one of the scary things about starting your own business, and particularly this type of business where you're going to be venture backed, I think you look at the end state and the end state is kind of intimidating and terrifying. And it still is, right? I'm the CEO of an insurance company. is like That is even an intimidating concept now. But when you start out and you think straight to the end state, it's scary. But then when you break it down into the things you need to do, for me, at least, it felt like things I knew how to do. So, you know, we needed to do customer discovery. I had done years of customer discovery type conversations with clients. Then we needed to put our ideas into a business plan. It's like I've done a zillion business plans. You know, we needed to pitch. I'm an excellent pitcher. Like, we needed to hire. We've hired before. We needed to do a budget. We've done a budget before. So all of these things, and I think in part because Paul, Tom, and I, you know, Paul had a 25-plus year career in hedge funds. Tom had 15 years at Bloomberg and NASDAQ in these fintech product development type roles. And I had my 15 years in law firms, and I'd managed teams and stuff. So it started to break down to things that we knew how to do, and then that felt much more attainable. And so we always have the end goal of what we want to be. Like, what does Kita want to be in 2030? But then we also had what the end goal of this year, what are we going to have achieved? What does that mean that I need to do this month? And then what does that mean I need to achieve this week? And that tends to be how we work. Like this week, I will not end this week unless I have done this thing. And because that means I will have completed this by the end of the month, which means we'll be on track to hit our end targets. But I felt like after that first six weeks, it I got onto a reasonably even keel of things I knew how to do. And then that made me feel comfortable, even when I had to do things I did not know how to do, like negotiate with VCs on term sheet. But it was enough to carve out the things I truly didn't know how to do. Sandroid. And then Carbon 13 was there and they gave really good counsel and support to get us through those things. Andy, was it smooth selling for you as well? You are already away from Cambridge uh, in COVID. Oh, yeah. The smoothest, Andrei. Not a bump in the road. <laughs> the journey is not smooth ever. The good thing we had customers engaged. We had people sort of we were working with in Carbon 13. And before we took on investment, we, we got our first paying client. And I think one of the biggest proof points for us and something that I have to give both Chris Coleridge and Oyvind Henriksen, who was a entrepreneur in residence at the time, support for, for their support in was turning that customer from 
somebody who was trialing our product for free to giving us money. And it wasn't a lot of money. But one of the biggest proof points is as soon as somebody goes from using your product for free, even if they're paying 1p, right, that relationship changes. They are now parting with money to give you to access whether it's your software or your services, whatever it is. And that was the first big bump that we overcame in Carbon 13. And it's a great credit to people like Chris and Oyvind for pushing us to be like, make them pay. And then after that, that gave us great confidence. Being like, oh, people will pay for this. It does. It, in your mind, you you go from having this idea. It's like, well, I think it's good. It's definitely delivering value. We very much undervalued the service to start with, which can be quite traditional when you're building something. Um, and what they did is everybody else we were engaged with, we started talking to them. And then the conversation turned from free trialing to, to paying. And we onboarded, I think, in the first four months after leaving Carbon 13, like our first five customers, paying customers, um, which was great. And, you know, we're not talking huge sums of money here, but it was a really real symbolic win that people are willing to part with money to pay for the services that we're providing. Then the bumpiness was repeating that and finding more people and scaling. And I think the a biggest bump for us, it's great to get that commercial win, but then when you're building a software business, you're constantly almost playing catch up sometimes to what you promise people because you're like, you have a roadmap. It's like, this is going to get delivered. Things quite often miss the deadline in a software business, especially when you're building things from scratch for the first time. It just happens. So bumpiness comes from the customers you've got, making sure that you're delivering what you promised them. And we made a conscious choice as well within the first 12 months to start looking at larger businesses. Um we had this aspiration that we wanted to serve smaller businesses and help them decarbonize, which we do and we still do. It's very difficult to grow a business and just based on the SME market because of the margins, especially a software business in the early stages. So we said, well, can we help bigger businesses? And yes, we can. And yes, we do. But the level of service that we provide had to increase significantly and the scope of the software had to increase significantly. And we brought on Ocado, who I mentioned before, and we've been working with them. And what we realized actually is we can start to look at the smaller businesses separately as well, but through the supply chain. And we can hopefully use larger businesses to access the smaller businesses and decarbonize together, bring them all on the same software. Um, it's great for the larger businesses who, who use them as suppliers because it refines their footprint. They can understand how they're decarbonizing in the supply chain. And for the smaller businesses, sometimes it can help them with having that support from one of their biggest customers. So in terms of bumps, many bumps on the road until then, and there's these constant sort of mini pivots of, of strategy and also working really, really intensely and, and hard in the background to deliver against what you've promised different customers, which just feels like a, a little bit of a firefighting sometimes. And of course, in the back of your mind, you're also then thinking about the roadmap. It's like, well, I am building this, but we need to think about this as well. You know, how do we get the next thing? How do we grow this business even further? How do we capture the next large customer? So yeah, it's never plain sailing. But when you look at it retrospective, you can iron out the bumps it seems like you know you can always draw the graph that goes like that but if you were to zoom in on it i would say the journey to date and it will continue to be is lots of lots of peaks and trots i like the visual imagery of, of a smooth curve if you look at it from ten thousand feet but lots of yeah. uh, bumps and, that, and, and that's the narrative that you play to investors right uh, yeah, but you know, two things that you said uh, resonate with me personally, which is that you know, before I started my climate finance firm, I was uh, running the services of a software company, which was uh, providing talent management software, learning management software to really large organizations. And we never, I can assure you, I mean, our product development team was staffed with some really brilliant people from Microsoft. With due respect to them, I hope they listen to this podcast. We never hit any significant product roadmap milestone. It was always slipping. But the other thing was that this is the time when I was also responsible for developing the SaaS strategy in that company. I realized that it's really hard to make money from small and medium enterprises. The, theoretically, the SaaS market should target the small and medium enterprises. You really have to make money from the large organizations. And then the large organizations have a lot of unique needs and aspirations 
which you have to balance a little bit. So, you know, this resonates with me quite a lot. One thing that I wanted to ask you as, as we come to the end of this podcast is Chris was here on the podcast in July. And one thing he kept on saying is that what we really want to build is this community, right? And obviously you've graduated, you're sort of, you know, fighting your own battles in your own cities. Has the community thing played out at all in your lives as you build a business, Talia? Yeah, I think so. I think it has. I mean, the Carbon 13 community is pretty strong. I think sometimes it's just a question of time. We're obviously very busy building the business. And actually, like Andy says, I certainly did not mean to imply we don't have bumps. Probably most of my this is the thing I need to achieve this week is fixing a bump such that the end of the month target isn't completely derailed. Sometimes I probably where I don't spend enough time is building my own community of people who can help just because I spend that time with my kids. But I do have probably actually the other female CEOs within my cohort. I speak to them a lot, not actually necessarily based on them being female, just actually they've they've built successful startups that are still, you know, still functioning. So we have a nice little WhatsApp group. So within the insurance market, we're very fortunate to work within Lloyd's of London where there's other insurance startups that work in the same space as us. And so that's a good community that I just see every day. And we tend to do the same things within insurance and ask questions like, how do you deal with this regulatory approval? I don't understand it, et cetera, et cetera. But then really, I'd say the majority of support that I get is from Paul and Tom. And that comes back to the importance of having a very strong co-founding team because nobody will really understand the ups and the downs. And like Andy said, the little strategy pivots and then thinking, was that right or was that wrong? More than your co-founders will. And while you always need to portray this kind of veneer of strength externally, internally is where you need to be able to be honest. And so I think that not a community, but that's just me, I suppose. I'm an inherently somewhat antisocial person and I have to speak to people all day. When I'm done speaking to people as part of Kita, I tend to just go home rather than engage more widely. Yeah, it's really funny. But, you know, you obviously said in the beginning that you focus a lot on relationships. And and I've seen people who focus on relationships also being, you use the word antisocial. I, I, would I, use the word, yeah, you, I, you, I tend to have strong, a small number of strong relationships rather than building a wide community for for myself in terms of who I engage with on a regular basis. Right. This is really very common among people who, who sort of balance building relationships, being out there at the same time, creating this space for yourself. Andy, what's been the journey like since you raised your investments and started putting customers in the bag? Yeah, I mean, it's similar experience with the community, Sandroy. We still speak to people from our cohort, but coming through the Carbon 13 community, there was that connection. Uh, and they graciously shared because, you know, you're all on this journey. And like I said, they've done an incredible raise and any learnings that we can take from that is is really helpful to us. And Natalia very thankfully shared that. Um, so that's just a great example of, I think for me, that community coming in. There's also this sense for us of, I don't know if it's co-opetition or friendly competition by going through these co- through these cohorts with people um, who are your peers, who you're either directly involved with in a cohort or in other cohorts and seeing them go on to successes is one really inspiring. We need to get our shit together as well. You know, look, we're doing well, but I think we can always do better. And I think that's, it's really empowering to see other people succeed because it helps you. It helps focus you, right? And it helps remind you why you're here. When you see these people, organizations like Kita and other organizations, one in our cohort, uh, Infius have just done a really successful raise. They're doing great things. It's inspiring to us. It's helpful to us to, to see them go on this similar journey. And I'd say that's, you feel a sense of community and you're, you feel happy for them. You know, you're sharing in their successes, even though it was nothing to do with you. It, it, it's a nice feeling. And then anybody that you ever message within the Carbon 13 community is, is usually only more than happy. And Carbon 13 do quite a good job at trying to run events. And with Natalia, I mean, today, I think I've, I've got eight hours of calls. By the end of that, you know, I'm married or I spend time with my wife. I have to go on a run or do something where you've got half an hour, 45 minutes just to yourself. I don't have children. I don't know how you do that. I'm not going to lie and say, yeah, yeah, we talk to people every day from around the community. We don't. But... If anybody ever messages me or the team or Bank or Vanessa, 
we try and give back and help out as much as we can. Um, and likewise, I think I feel that if we ever need support or need help from another cohort member or people that have been through that, nine times out of 10, they reply and, and they're more than willing to help. And I think entrepreneurs in general, you're really, really pushed for time. But especially in this community where you're trying to do something positive for the world, if you receive an email from someone you know or someone you don't and you can help, I find people want to help. So it's really nice that people have sought you out and asked for your advice on something. And for instance, I've been messaged many times by people thinking of applying to Carbon 13 and looking for advice. Uh, Natalia's nodding, I'm sure she has as well. And you're only too happy to share your experiences of that. And some people I've spoken to have gone on to go into Carbon 13. Some people haven't. You're only too happy to to share those experiences. The only thing you're conscious of, you, you don't want to influence their decision too strongly and that's i always caveat that it's like look this is your choice but if you can learn anything from my experiences here they are you know this uh, helping each other I, I must acknowledge that this present podcast is not about natalia's business right it's about people starting climate businesses what they should think about when they think about applying for uh, incubators right this is really helping out and you know you are I acknowledge that in the beginning of the day you've come on this call and you know you're, you're sharing I think that's the thing that speaks to you know what you said both of you said and one thing that I must say is critical is that we talked a little bit about bumps in the road and, and I think that all goes back to this issue of teaming which both of you talked about in detail and that's how yeah, I mean I can imagine that you know you're building an Excel spreadsheet and <laughs> writing yes no maybe and you know small notes against each of them and and the, I, I can well imagine that you're picking up the phone and you know, talking to your founder and saying Vanessa we should go back and talk to her today afternoon I think a lot of people get it that, that the first sale that you have to do is to your own co- colleagues and founders you have to sell the ideas only then you can sell to customer and then only can that, that you sell to investors. To me, that's really an important takeaway for people listening to this podcast. We've come to the end of the podcast, so I've got to ask you, Andy, first you, what's 2024? What is your next goal? Yeah, continue to scale the business, onboard another several customers like Ocado, growing the team, uh, which I haven't spoken to too much about here, but which has been an absolute joy. We've got some fantastic people that have joined us. We're onboarding three people in the next three weeks. We're recruiting another five positions. There'll be a raise in there this summer as well. So it's it's all go. We feel like we have a good understanding of product market fit of what we've got i'm sure next week that will completely change but right right this second we feel like we have that and it's about executing on that and just trying to scale that business as best as we can um, over the next 12 months natalia what's your next goal yeah i mean similar to andy uh, there's always a lot of goals i can't it might have been chris from carbon 13 who said this but someone at some point said to me you have a lot of wheels to roll and what you need to make sure that no one wheel gets too far in front or too far behind because you need all the wheels to be ready when it's go time, whatever that go time happens to be. And so I've always thought about it in that context. So we always, just like Andy, you know, we need to improve and always be iterating on our product market fit because the carbon markets are always changing. We always need to be Improving our regulatory approvals within insurance, how you handle your regulatory approvals is core to how you're able to sell insurance. And so we always need to be expanding our regulatory approval processes. You know, we always need to be building our partnerships with our insurance backers because without them, we can't sell insurance. We always need to be building relationships with funders because you always need to be looking to that next fundraise and what's the story that your investors are going to believe in and do they trust you? And then, again, that team is hugely important, I think, actually, as a founder to create also that kind of mental health. Once you have a strong team around you, you can actually take time off and trust that the whole thing's not going to fall down around you. So it's hiring and onboarding the team and making sure that just management of them, making sure that they feel fulfilled. And then I think the overall of it for us is always comes back to we started Kita because we believe in this. We believe in what we're doing. And we always come back to, are we still doing something that we think is achieving that that end goal? 
because we always want to make sure it doesn't go off. So are we still achieving what we believe in and what we think we need to be doing? And then the second is, are we still having fun? And so Paul Tom and I actually had that conversation. Are we still in line with the vision? And then are we still all having fun? Because I think we need those two things to make us all continue to function at what needs to be actually a very high level. So yeah, keep the wheels going is the real end goal for um, for this year. I was just going to pick up um, on what Natalia said, Sandro, in terms of you can't underestimate the challenge of building the team and getting the right people, but having fun, that main KPI is like, are, we, are you still hitting the target and we're having fun? That's something we do, X tons of feelings. So we did it every week, but now every month we, we sort of like basically, I guess for want of a better word, survey everybody in the business and we've got a bunch of questions and it's like, you know, is, is current workload sustainable? Are you happy? Are you working on the right things? Do you feel like we're moving in the right direction? And it's something we try to embed in, in the organization. We haven't always got this right because I feel, well, maybe you can always get it right. We haven't, but making sure that if things are getting a little bit out of control, we've at least sense checking it every month and understanding if people, what the barometer of happiness is like and morale is like across staff and founders. Um, and then we speak about that as a, as a co-founder team, but also as a business as well. And I think one of the toughest things or something we're really keen to do, but not be a challenge is keep that going as, as we bring on more people into the business. Um, because as Natalia said, the success of your business ultimately is down to the people within it. And if they're not happy, you're not going to have a good business. Absolutely Thanks. important, I think. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions for me? Carbon 13, you had a conversation with Chris Colridge last summer. Does it align with how you would expect it to align based on what Chris said? Yeah, every business starts with the hypothesis, right? And I think Chris's business, if I can call it Carbon 13, starts with the hypothesis that businesses fail because teams do not get along with each other. And teams do not get along with each other because in the natural course of your lives, entrepreneurs, Natalia said, you meet people who are like you, right? And so this uh, process of being put together in a pressure environment where you are one among the smart people in the room, that challenges your assumptions. You know, what, what do I bring to the table? And then you have a little bit more systematic way of finding a founder. So that's exactly the point. I think Chris would be very happy when he listens to this podcast. And we should also mention who I ever mentioned today, Nikki and Michael as well. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful day, Andy and Natalia. Thank you very much, Sanjoy. Hey, Sanjoy. Good to be here.